I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Keith Ghostland. I'm Ann Charles. It's Tuesday, June 13th. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. Uh, as you may know, we are taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as unceded indigenous land. So, Linda, take it away. Well, thank you, Ann. Well, you got fun stuff? I have fun stuff <coughs> and bad stuff. So, there's been a spike in LG, LGBTQ rhetoric and threats have taken a heavy toll on pride celebrations in the United States this year, organizers say, especially in states where politicians want to curtail rights. This month's celebrations in Houston, the largest pride event in conservative Texas, has been scaled back due to rising insurance and security costs, as well as concerns over soar soaring temperatures and capacity. We made the decision to cancel the festival this year, said Kendra Walker, president of Pride Houston 365, downgrading the plans to a parade. The change was first announced in January as Texas lawmakers prepared bills restricting gender-affirming health care and drag performances. Now Pride planners across the U.S. and Canada say they are facing higher bills because of anti-LGBTQ disinformation and hate. So. Because you need insurance for your events and the mm. carriers are putting the premium through the ceiling. Mm. Wilton Manners is not having one this year, I can't. Okay. Senator Tom Tillis, Republican North Carolina, was censored by Republican delegates in North Carolina over his votes on LGBTQ rights, gun violence, and more. The Senate vote was taken behind closed doors at an annual North Carolina Republican Party state convention. A two-thirds majority of the party's 1,801 voting delegates was needed for the measure to pass. Many delegates criticized Tillis over his work on the Respect of Marriage um, Act. The legislature guarantees federal recognition of marriage between two people if the union was valid in the state where they were married, enshrining rights for same-sex and interracial couples. Alex Keene, a 38-year-old gay man who grew up in the conservative royal Indiana town of Cornersville, population 13,000, wanted to show support for his local LGBT club plus community. So last December, he founded a group called Whitewater Pride and later organized three events for the Pride Month. The state and national Republican platforms opposed same-sex marriage, but Tillis was supporter of the legislature and lobbied his fellow Republicans to back the law. Soon after announcing the events, two residents, Melissa Rose and her husband, Andrew Rose, set up a now-defunct Facebook group called White Grotta Groomer Removers, mm. which insinuated that Keene is a child sex abuser. Its members harassed his event sponsors. Keene has been followed in public by the group's supporters and has gone into hiding. He now plans on moving out of the state, Sorry. worried that someone will target him for violence. So, You know, I was talking to a friend, and we were saying that a lot of people are leaving Florida yes. for that reason. Yeah. It's such a cesspool politically. But then, you know, what's going to be left? God help us. Okay. Well, the yeah. Independent People's Republic of Vermont. Yeah. A small Florida town in Miami-Dade County has defied the wishes of its mayor to celebrate Pride Month and fly the rainbow flag despite opposition of Surfside Mayor Shlomo Denzinger. The town's commission commissioners voted three to two to officially recognize June as Pride Month and to hold the ceremony, ceremony to raise the flag. So that's good news. Um, Louisiana Governor Bell Edwards, Democrat, has said he will veto three bills that target LGBTQ and vowed to veto any other anti-LGBTQ bills sent to his desk. Edwards compared the Republican attempts to target the LGBTQ community with opposition to the civil rights movement. So. 
Amid anti-LGBTQ protests at school, the Los Angeles Unified School <coughs> District's board, led by its out president, Jackie Goldberg, has taken a stand for diversity and inclusion. The LA Unified Board unanimously adopted a resolution Tuesday in support of LGBT community and Los Angeles and um, Los Angeles in general. It reads that the district proclaims and commemorates June as LGBTQ plus Pride Month, October as LGBTQ plus History Month, as well as October 11th as National Coming Out Day. November 20th as Transgender Day of Remembering, March 31st as Transgender Day of Visibility, and April 12th as the Day of Silence. It also encourages school to incorporate LGBTQ lessons throughout the year. So that was good news, wasn't it? Yeah. President Joe Biden on Thursday blasted efforts across the country to roll back LGBTQ protections, referring to proponents of the restrictions as hysterical and prejudiced during a joint news conference at the White House along British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Biden said the administration's fight for LGBTQ rights is far from over because we have some hysterical and, I would argue, prejudiced people who are engaged in all of what we've seen going around this country. The American Civil Liberties Union is tracking 491 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced across the U.S. since the beginning of 2023 legislative session. It's nice that he did that with the British Prime Minister. Yes. In attendance. <laughs> now we need to sponsor a Drag Queen Story Hour at the White House. Good. I, I think they should does. couple it with the Easter egg hunt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, drag queens out there doing Easter egg hunt. That's great. All right, now here is an interesting story because, you know, in Ann and I's travel around the United States, we've always avoided this um, restaurant. But Chick-fil-A. No. <laughs> mm -mm. The restaurant chain known as much for its quirky gift shops and addicting peg solitaire games as it is for its stick to your ribs fair has actually been celebrating pride and publishing rainbow themed products for the last few years. Many people still remember the company's intolerant past when they openly discriminated against LGBT plus workers in the early 1990s and activists descended on Cracker Barrel restaurants to protest their policy of promoting heterosexual values. The policy has been disconnected soon after and the company has continued to make positive strides. It currently holds an 80 out of 100 on the Human Rights Campaign Corporate <laughs> Equality Index. I'm mm. surprised. So now when you're traveling around um, the U.S., you can stop at your local Crackle Barrel. I've Did, never been to a Crackle Barrel. I haven't either. But I have. Have you? Yeah. Oh, Linda. <laughs> well, I traveled across country many times. She has know. a jaded past. I know. Okay. The pre-consciousness, I guess. <laughs> and I'm going to do this one more story here. Uh, Missouri has become the latest state to be in gender-affirming care for transgender wow. minors and to bar trans student athletes from competing under their gender identity. Republican Governor Mike Parson signed Senate Bill 49, the Gender Affirming Care Ban, uh, and the Senate Bill 39, the Sports Bill, into law Wednesday. He did so privately in his office and without a ceremony because the issue is divisive to some, he told a group of reporters. Divisive to some. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Keith, what you got? I'll do a poll. So as Linda has pointed out, th this is Pride Month. And as opposed to the rest of the country, Vermont, rather than canceling event, we're having 14. <laughs> oh my. However, the first Vermont Pride event occurred 40 years ago this year, June 25th, 1983 in Burlington. Did it have a theme? 
I'm sure it did. Stay tuned. Okay, so events, we have Rainbow Umbrella, the women's discussion group, book discussion group, same book. Vagabonds. All right. So Monday is Juneteenth. Yes. And I did not see anything listed for Montpelier or the State House this oh. year, which kind of surprises me. However, on Sunday the 18th in Essex, at the Essex Experience Green from 1 to 3, they're having a celebration as is downtown Winooski mm -hmm. on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then on Monday, Juneteenth itself, the Old Stone Museum in Brownington, the Twilight, 1 to 3 p.m., they're doing a celebration. And at Burlington City Hall on Monday, huh. 1 p.m., they're doing a celebration. So, oh, good. So looking at our Pride events, Brattleboro, Friday, June 23rd, 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. at the Stone Church is their glam queer dance party and cabaret. <laughs> now, Bethel, they're going to be having fun starting Thursday, June 22nd with Gay Trivia at Babes. Friday we is... No, we could have won it. No, it's coming up. Oh. We still have time. Ah. And then on Friday is the Mass Queer Aid Ball. Mm. Dress up. And then on um, Saturday is the family meeting, the Pride Picnic, the Parasol Promenade. Yeah. So, About which you did a very interesting interview I, yes. last Saturday. And be looking for a follow-up interview because there may be a book being published about Slavery and Vermont, mm. something that we don't acknowledge or talk about a great deal. So, and then on, in Burlington on Saturday, June 24th, this is the People's Pride mm. starting at 3 p.m. at Oak Ledge Park. Do you know who's doing that? It's the same group that we interviewed several years ago. Right. Really? Okay, it's, good. LG, it's the same Facebook post. LGBTQ plus queer pride with no cops, no banks, an alternative to the um, so-called official pride mm -hmm. in September. And then I had promoted this before in North Conway, New Hampshire, also on Saturday the 24th, is their pride festival. And what was unique about this is Reverend Yolanda, who is an old favorite of ours, will be coming to MC for them. <coughs> Springfield is also doing an event on Saturday, June 24th, Rainbow Palooza <laughs> Pride and Veg Fest. You may want to go, Anne. Mm -hmm. uh, starting at five, noon to 5 p.m. Bennington, also on Saturday, is their cute queer youth prom from 7 to 10 p.m. And then on Sunday is their parade and block, block party. <laughs> And then Newport on June 25th, this is the first Northeast Kingdom Pride Festival, downtown Newport starting at noon. Middlebury is also having a Pride Festival on June 25th. I can't keep my calendar straight. <laughs> June, to, uh, June 25th, Middlebury Town Green, 1 to 5 p.m. Also, I'm going to put out there again on Sunday the 25th, starting at 2 p.m. at Ellie Long Music Center, is the memorial for Michael Hayes, Marguerite LeMay. So, uh, the Vermont Humanities Council, on Sunday, June 25th at 11 a.m., this is a live event at the Kingsland State Park in Addison, Words in the Woods, and this is Toby McNutt. Or whom, yes. And Toby McNutt's work engages themes of embodiment, space, and relationship from a queer and disabled perspective. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But also out there in the woods, and maybe <laughs> muttering some poetry, <laughs> On Saturday, July 15th in Elmore, I think it's also at 11 a.m. It is. It may be the you know, winner of that Wicked Woman's <laughs> Award, our own Linda Quinlan. So in, in my last sort of events, and this is ongoing um, through November 26th, Hall Art Foundation 
which is in Reading or Reading, Vermont, a collection of a hundred paintings, Small is Beautiful, Andy Warhol. Oh, wow. And huh. this is from the Hall's personal collection wow. of Andy Warhol works. And they, they said everybody is used to sort of the big murals and mm -hmm. you know, um, silk screens. These are the smaller paintings. Huh. And a hundred of them. Wow, so very impressive. We, we may have to put it up. We may have to yes. do a road trip. Okay. Well, now you're going to take me to far and distant places again. Not really. I'm um, deviating from the norm today because a lot has been going on in our communities culturally. So uh, Linda and Keith have given me permission to stay stateside, stateside and talk about several events of great interest to our communities. The first is the 2023 Lambda Literary Awards. Uh, it announced the winners of the 35th Annual Lambda Literary Awards, selected by a panel of over 60 professionals from more than um, 1,300 book submissions from over 300 publishers. So we are everywhere. In addition to the winners below, five special honors were awarded. Ebony J. Dunbar got the Randall Keenan Prize. Ah. Shakira Diaz got the Cordova Prize. And I think we read Ordinary Girls in yes. our book group. Maya Salome and Nassim Jamnia got the Markowitz Prize. Christopher Tradowski got the Samuel Prize. Aaron Hamburger and Raika Aoki got the Duggins Prize. And interestingly, there's a prize now um, for writers over 50, emerging writers over 50. So good for them. I believe Mr. Tradowski won that one. Um, let's go. I'm going to tell you all the winners, if you don't mind. <laughs> it's an illustrious crowd. Um, lesbian fiction. The honor was taken by J. Ming Chang, who wrote a collection of short stories, Gods of Want, uh, published by One World Publishing. Gay fiction, The Foghorn Echoes by Danny Ramadan, Canon Gate Books. And I've been listening to a Pod, podcasts of this group called the Radical Books Collective. And both of these publishers have been uh, represented in the, on that podcast. So I'm learning many things. Bisexual fiction went to Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Kiste, SNS Saga Press. Transgender fiction went to The Call Out by Cat Fitzpatrick, Seven Stories Press. Bisexual Nonfiction, Appropriate Behavior by Maria San Filippo, McGill Queens University Press. Now we that's, have all these books that's not we, can, <laughs> we can put on our list for reading. Uh, transgender Nonfiction, The Third Person by Emma Grove, Drawn in Quarterly Press. LGBTQ plus nonfiction went to the Black Period on Personhood, Race, and Origin by Havska Augustus Geeter, Random House. So it's a really interesting mixture of small presses and... I was going to say, the Random House is one of the big boys on the block. That's right. Damn. Lesbian Poetry, As She Appears by Shelley Wong, Yes, Yes Books. Gay Poetry, Some Integrity by Padraig Regan, Carsonet Press. Bisexual Poetry, Real Phones and Genuine Fakes. Oh, I'm sorry, Real Phonies and Genuine Fakes by Nikki Beer. That's basically Milk edition. <laughs> yeah. Makes more sense, huh? Um, transgender Poetry, Miss Seti by Comden Ishmael Hilliard, Nightboat Books. Lesbian memoir, autobi uh, lesbian memoir biography, Lost and Found, a memoir by Katherine Schultz, also Random House. Gay memoir biography, High Risk Homosexual, a memoir by Edgar Gomez, Soft Skull Press. <coughs> a lesbian romance, The Rules of Forever Ooh. by Nan Campbell, Bold Stroke Books. I want that one. <laughs> Gay Romance, 
Uh, I'm not so over you. Kosoko Jackson, <laughs> Berkeley Romance, and now doo -doo -doo, lesbian, LGBTQ plus anthology, and I have a picture to accompany this outright. The speeches that shaped LGBTQ literary culture, edited by Julie Enzer and Elena Gross. Right yes. under your name. Yes. What a fabulous, that is, I really encourage you to read it. It's a fabulous, wonderful collection. Very moving. Uh, and before I heard that they got the award, I was just thinking how, what a fine book it is. Rutgers University Press. So, uh, and they had a wonderful, or kind enough to do a great interview on this show. They're lovely people and it's a fine book. So read it yes. as you can. Um, LGBTQ plus children's books, Mighty Red Riding Hood by Wallace West, Little Brown Books how, for Young how Readers. How soon will they be kicked out of the library? I was going to say, <laughs> or, order big and we're mailing them to the deep <laughs> south. <laughs> LGBTQ plus middle grade, Nick Hill Out Loud by Maulik Pacholi, Balser and Bray, LGBTQ plus young adult, the Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes, Balzer and Bray. LGBTQ plus comics, Mamo by Sas Millage, Voom Studios. LGBTQ plus, is it getting too long for you? Only a few more. LGBTQ plus drama, If a Janiah and the Furies on Torian Land and Antigone with a Chinese um, Ideograph by Ho Ka K by Jeff Ho, Playwrights Canada Press. Uh, LGBTQ plus romance and erotica, Kiss Her Once for Me by Allison Cochran, Atria Books. LGBTQ plus mystery, Dirt Creek, a novel by Haley Scrivener, Flatiron Books. LGBTQ plus speculative fiction, The Wicked and the Willing by Liana Tan, Shattered Scepter Press, and not to be outdone, LGBTQ plus studies, Keeping It Unreal, Black Queer Fantasy and Superhero Comics by oh, Dear Reich, Scott, NYU Press. So congratulations, yes. a lot of stuff to read. I thought we were the queer drama. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, you know, it's everywhere. Queer drama, us, them. May I continue? I think you have, you can do another story if you have one. Or... It's another exciting cultural story about the Tony Awards. All right. So let me show you a picture, and um, if you wouldn't mind keeping the picture up while I describe what happened. It was a fabulous uh, ceremony, and you can see it on YouTube. And it began by the uh, wonderful host, Ariana DeVos, mm -hmm. turning the pages of an in empty script. Yeah. So in honor of the Writers uh, Guild strike, the entire um, ceremony was unscripted. It was so cool. But of course, um, it's critic, Tony. So. It's live theater. Of uh -huh. course it's unscripted. <laughs> yeah, I know it. They handled it beautifully. The 76 Tony Awards took place Sunday night. I watched from, you know, from beginning to end. And uh, the top winners of the evening included Kimberly Akimbo for the best musical, Leopold Stat for best play, Meanwhile, Top Dog Underdog won Best Revival of a Play, while Parade picked up the trophy for Best Revival of a Musical. And all of this is very interesting, I think, because I learned that Leopold's stat is about anti-Semitism, as is Parade. So uh, very important plays. Top Dog Underdog is a revival by Susan Laurie Parks, an African-American playwright of great renown hosted by Ariana DeBose, and they opened with a wonderful dance number, worthy only of Broadway. Uh, the <laughs> ceremony was on the verge of being canceled because of the WGA writer's strike, but they pulled it through and created a fairly good show, according to this critic. It's, it was more than fairly good. Uh, more than that, the show included very queer, oh, this is the advocate. More than that, uh, the school included very queer moments from the night's biggest winners. So now let's look at this picture. At the top corner, we have Alex Newell and the buzz and rave reviews of Alex Newell's performance in Shucked 
came to fruition tonight when she won the Tony Award for Best Performance by an actor in a featured role in a musical. After commenting, this woman is wonderful. After commenting on how hot the room was, Newell took a moment to admit that she has been waiting for her entire life to get this award. I thank each and every one of you in this room right now, and Mommy, I love you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for loving me unconditionally. Thank you for teaching me what strength is. Newell went on to thank their fellow Shucked cast and crew, calling them The Rock. They closed with, and I just love this, I would have applauded in place um, if I'd been in company. They closed with, thank you for seeing me, Broadway. I should not be up here as a queer, non-binary, fat, black, little baby from Massachusetts. Yes. From Lynn. <laughs> She's from Lynn. <laughs> Everyone has researched this now. And to anyone that thinks that they can't do it, I'm going to look you dead in the face and say that you can do anything you put your mind to. All right. Resounding applause. Uh, now, in the top left, Adding to the non-binary representation for the evening, Jay Harrison Gee was met with thunderous applause when they were announced as the winner for best performance by an actor in a leading role in a musical for their performance in Some Like It Hot. My mother raised me to understand that the gifts that God gave me were not about me, to use them to be effective in the world and to help somebody else's journey, said Guy. So thank you for teaching me how to live, how to love, how to give. They continued, for every trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming human, whoever was told that you couldn't be seen, this is for you. She thanked the show's producers and allowing them to let lives be seen. Great. Now, the bottom left on this picture that will be, has been up, I hope, during some of my commentary, Michael Arden won the best direction of a music, must be musical, for his work with Parade, said in his acceptance speech, to our beautiful trans non-binary queer youth, know that your queerness is what makes you beautiful and powerful. Everyone in this room sees you and needs you, and we will fight alongside you, and we will win. Growing up, I was called the F word more times than I can remember. And here he was bleeped, and the audience all applauded, and I was so, CBS was afraid of being fined. So the caption police stepped in. Um, <laughs> according to the caption police, people across the internet, he said, growing up, I was called the F word more times than I can remember, and now I'm a faggot with a Tony. <laughs> yes! <laughs> so keep raising your voices, my friends. He encouraged people to continue to stand up against intolerance and keep loving and uplifting each other, standing up for each other. He also encouraged peers to continue making challenging art and vote every chance you get. Finally, the bottom right. Leopold Schatz, Brandon Uranowitz won the Tony Award for Best Performance by an Actor in a Featured Role in a Play and said to anyone who's watching who is a parent, when your, chi when your child tells you who they are, believe them. He continued, protect, celebrate, and water that truth because an authentic life is a limitless life. The only reason I'm standing here is because my parents did that for me growing up. They stood beside me and they believed me when I said who I am. So I thank you. I love you all. What a fabulous ceremony yeah, it was. Yeah, it was good. So I have some headlines. No, I'm, I'm going to, we have to move on now. Okay. All righty. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> In Collin County, conservative Republicans located north of Dallas posted and then deleted several items to their Facebook page last week, critical of the LGBT community and Pride Month. They had on their site, welcome to the month of the demon. The group wrote Thursday morning, protect your children, just say no to rainbows. So, oh. I know. Here's a good story, I suppose. On Monday, Rachel Maddow, Maddow helped NBC, MSNBC achieve more viewers during prime time than Fox News or CNN.
On Tuesday evening, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi threw the, cel a <coughs> the ceremonial first pitch at the Washington Nationals <laughs> LGBTQ that. Night Out game. I have a picture of her holding her hands up after she throws the ball. The 83-year-old congresswoman walked out to the pitcher's mound, took a few steps toward home plate, and lobbed the ball to the catcher, who wore the Nationals mascot costume and a rainbow shirt. The game marked the team's 18th annual night out event, making it the longest-running pride celebration in a major league baseball. Was she wearing heels, I wonder? Of I bet. course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Meet you, ass. <laughs> uh, Greater Works Church in the community of Five Points held an event Saturday in partnership with the anti-queer South Carolina group Christian Families Against Destructive Decisions an organization seeking to uphold the values of the nuclear family. Pastor Ronald Gates, who oversees Great Works, participated in a video presentation titled The Solution to Society's Problems, which blamed gender identity, pornography, divorce, abortion for the collapse of the traditional family values. We want to strengthen the family who God has created, Gates said. According to a local TV station, God created a man and a woman. When it comes to the LGBT community, I want to say this. God loves everyone. Sin, he does not negotiate. In blah, response, blah, blah. Five Point community members decided to send a message of love. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to throw you An acceptance to the LGBT community and residents outside the church on Saturday. Residents engulfed the sidewalks with coverable chalk artwork in a show of sol solidarity and a dig at church leaders. Church so, leaders, blah, yes. blah, blah, blah. I know. These ones, anyway. Scatacoy. Elementary school in North Hollywood will have heightened security on Friday as some parents protest a pride event at the campus, sparking complaints that the topic is one that should be left for parents to teach rather than having it imposed on kids. And here's a picture of the protest right here. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is good news. A federal judge in Tennessee has ruled that the state law limiting public drag show performances represented an unconstitutional restriction on freedom of speech. So that was good news. Now, the Attorney General of Texas, Greg Abbott, made a name for himself by fighting the federal government. Wait, wait, Greg Abbott's the governor. Yes. Oh, when he was Attorney General. Okay. As Attorney General. Because the governor is currently. Yeah, being he's indicted, governor now, he? but when he was. No, I mean, the, the, attorney the current General. Attorney General is indicted. <laughs> Paxton. He made a name for himself by fighting federal government and suing the Obama administration 31 times. As governor, Abbott has found a new enemy, local governments. Now, this is really interesting because, in essence, they, they're passing a law that. No town or county can um, go against state regulations. So if the state says no drag, Houston can't say, well, we're going to allow it in our mm -hmm. communities. So they're going to override all of that by, if they pass this bill. Now, this is good. I have a picture of this, which is really um, fun. On Tuesday, my dad would be proud. June 12th, more than 100 Teamsters gathered, gathered in Hollywood, California to march in the 50th annual Los Angeles Pride Parade. All right, good. I know. This was the first time ever that Teamsters had marching contingent in the iconic and historic parade. Joining the Teamsters were over 130 community coalitions, nonprofits, business, and even some other unions. So that was very good news. 
And f just a sad story for my last story here is um, about Anita Cornwell. And I'm show a picture of her now. She was 92. The Philadelphia writer who authorized the first, who authored the first published collection of essays by an out black lesbian has died. Her literary exec <coughs> I'm sorry. Her literary um, person who takes care of her work, Briona Simone Jones, said, Ms. Cornwell was the first black female writer to publicly identify as lesbian in print. Jones said, contributing to the latter, a lesbian publication, and Negro Digest in the 1950s, and later publishing her groundbreaking essay collection, Black Lesbian in a White America. In 1983, in those days when people could be fired for the suspicion they were gay, choosing to write about her lesbian identity as an unmarried black working class woman was nothing short of radical. We tend to under, underestimate how brave and daring and aus, aud, audacious it was to be out unapologetically as a lesbian in the 1970s, said Julie R. Enzer, editor of Sinister Wisdom, a lesbian literary and arts journal that is republishing Ms. Cornwell's work to put your face on the cover of a book that says lesbian was extraordinarily courageous and meaningful to so many people. Ms. Cornwell died May 27th at Wesley Enhanced Living Center in Germantown, surrounded by her compassionate women who cared for her. So May I add? Here's her picture. Yes. Um, add Julie, whatever you like. Julie Enzer is doing a tribute at Sinister Wisdom of Anita Cornwall. Yes. And Brianna Simone Jones is the editor of that groundbreaking anthology, Mouths of Rain, that won last year's Lammy of uh, Black Lesbian Writing. Well, thank you, Ann. That, that's good news. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, additional. Thank you. So I'm going to start with what has to be the quote of the week. Oh, OK. I want to know, do you really believe that garbage? And this was a comment that Becca Ballant made in an oversight committee hearing on clean energy. And it was, to, that. And it was to a former 45 environmental Denier. A, a, no, an environmental official. Ah. This is person who worked in the environment. And they were talking about clean energy. Oh, so you believe that investing strategies are actually a secret. It's weaponized to support and promote gender transition for children? Or do you just use it as another opportunity to beat up on children? I stepped out to sit down with parents of trans kids from states that have come after their kids, and now their kids can't get the level of care they deserve and need, Becca said. And they literally said, when you leave this room, would you please, the next time you're in a room with someone bringing up yet again our children and our families as some kind of boogeyman, that you'll actually stand up for us. I didn't think it would take less than half an hour. I didn't know that I would have such an opportunity. It feels like every single hearing I'm in, whether it's in oversight or whether it's in budget or whether it's in a subcommittee, somehow the witnesses find a way to bring in trans children into whatever conversation they're trying to have here. Thank you, Becca. Yes. And. This is the biggie. Becca is now on the House Judiciary Committee. Oh, she is. Salini, who stepped down, out legislator, returning to Rhode Island, running for office oh, there. Oh, Cicilline. Cicilline, yeah. Becca has been appointed to that position, so she's now on oversight, budget, and judiciary. All oh, right. I think people have noticed her. So 
I had said, or Susan had said on the last show that I would be talking about the veto session and the bills that the governor vetoed. I'm going to withhold that because there are things happening in our schools that I want to share with you. And the first is an incident that occurred here in Montpelier High School where on the first day of Pride Month in the gender neutral bathroom, someone painted a swastika on the wall in feces. Now, the school oh. responded by having an assembly, talking about the issue, that it was not okay, and telling the students that they had, they had every right to be upset. And there was a queer student of color living with a disability who said, I don't feel safe here. Mm -hmm. So it's not happening someplace else. This is in our backyard. And, and we need to be attentive and look at how we can support our youth. Also, also people were aware of the target incident that occurred nationwide, but New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, where it was someone promoting, stating they were representing the LGBTQ community and it was a bomb threat while it was swatting, it happened nationwide. But most of the mainstream LGBTQ plus political organizations have said, this is not how we approach this. This is not who we are. This is not what we support. And the final one, and I will tell you if I grip my teeth, you will understand. We have talked on previous shows about the incident at the Randolph School where it was a member of the girls' volleyball team targeted a transgender student using the locker room. And that student had an investigation for bullying, and there was a remedy put in place. That student's father was also removed as a soccer coach for the middle school because of misgendering and refusing to use right. appropriate gender pronouns. They were filed suit saying that their freedom of speech rights had been violated and they were represented by the Alliance Defending Freedom, who we've all reported on. Well, there's been a settlement in that case. And they gave the Alliance Defending Freedom and the student and their parent $125,000. Oh. They, the father was reinstated as the coach, oh. all referencing to the student engaging in bullying has been removed. And the reason that that decision was made, and it was not by the school who said, our policies are our policies, we are going to continue to follow them, but it was made by the Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust Insurance Company because, be, because when you sue the school district, this is the insurance company that has their liability insurance, so they would be paying for the attorneys to represent the school district, and they didn't want to have to pay out the money it would take to fully litigate this case, so they settled and gave the Alliance Defending oh, Freedom absolutely everything they had asked for. And let me tell you my concern. We cannot get our legislature to add a bullying statute that is based upon the impact or the best interest of our students rather than a severe and pervasive standard. And the argument has been, oh, we can't afford the litigation. Guess what? Our students are going to continue to be bullied. Yep. Oh, hard. Well, that's awful. Oh, God. Yep. I'm going to go through some headlines okay. and show my clip, and I, if I have time, I'll... You have a clip? I do. <laughs> um, Europe. Almost 7% of people in the UK changed sexual identity in six years, according to a study. Britain limits the use of puberty-blocking drugs to research only. Uh, European Rights Court rules against Ukraine on same-sex union case 
And this is sort of interesting. Uh, these two gentlemen, Andre Malumikin and Andre Markief, uh, sued in 2014 and um, were denied marriage rights. And so um, the court ruled that Ukraine, a signatory to the European Convention of Human Rights, had violated articles on discrimination and the right to private and family life. Um, in January, a survey by the National Democratic Institute of Kyiv said that 56% of Ukrainians support same-sex civil partnerships, while 24 oppose it. Such partnerships did not enjoy, this is interesting, uh, they didn't enjoy majority support before the Russians invaded, but the Russians' homophobic stance has pushed Ukrainians to favor LGBTQ rights more. Uh, Gay pride marches have been met with violent opposition from Ukrainian far-right groups. Uh, legalization is still opposed by conservative parts of the U Ukrainian society. And Zelensky um, responded positively to a related petition to that of these gentlemen, but um, said he can't alter the Constitution during wartime. But the European... Uh, Rights Court says, get on it, sir. Yeah, because they want to be in NATO and part of the European Union. Mm -hmm. right. Now, Latvia has its first gay president. I, I have a that. picture before you now of Edgars Rinkovics. He was elected the new president Wednesday, the first openly gay person to hold the office. Well, good I, for him. I know. I could tell you a little more about him. Um, he's... Uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky of Ukraine, congratulated him as a true friend of Ukraine. He's 49, will be the head of state of the EU and NATO member for the next four years. I will do everything for our country to prosper and be secure. He came out as gay at 20, as 2014, the first prominent political figure in the country to do so. Do you know if they're in danger of Russia, Russian invasion with them? I don't think so, okay. but I haven't heard. Now, of course, we have to talk about Uganda. Uh, yeah. There's HIV alarm as the anti-gay law uh, forces yeah. an LGBTQ lockdown. Uh, usually there are 50 patients at the uh, treatment center in Kampala. It's all but dried up. People are afraid to go. Um, the Kampala Clinic had been the beacon of success for the fight against HIV, where 1.4 million people live with the virus and 17,000 die a year um, as a result of its ravages. The World Bank has issued a group statement on Uga the Uganda 2023 Anti-Homosexuality Act condemning it. Now let's go on to Asia. Your Japan court rules that not allowing same-sex marriage is in a state of unconstitutionality. What that means is the Japanese court has ruled a ban on same-sex marriage is constitutional, but raises concerns about the dignity and human rights of same-sex couples, which is being seen as a step forward despite <laughs> falling short of activists' expectations. <laughs> So the key points are, are I've oft repeated. Japan is the only G7 nation without legal protection of same-sex unions. Five rulings on same-sex marriage have now been handed down around Japan. Opinion polls show that about 70% of the public support same-sex marriage. marriage. So now let's look at, at the Bangkok Pride Parade, where uh, the Thai PM front runner has marched promising same-sex marriage and gender identity rights. Um, the numbers of people going to these pride parades, thousands, um, march through central Bangkok, marking Pride Month. Um, they had love is love. The governor was there. Over 50,000 people wow. were there. That's amazing. A quiet afternoon with friends. Yeah. <laughs> it's more than double the attendance at last year's event. So what do you think? All right. Thailand. Go, bank. Go Thailand. 
Um, now, 30,000 people marched in Jerusalem Pride. Uh -huh. same, th same thing. Uh, and this uh, National Security Minister, Ben Gavir, was jeered by participants who shouted, Nazis out, at the far-right minister. Marchers also called to protect democracy um, and hold who also called to protect democracy hold, held anti-overhaul banners. Tens of thousands of Israelis gathered on Thursday. Um, 30,000 people, there's heavy security. Um, 2,000 police and riot police officers, as well as several lines of police barriers separating the parade oh. from a far right protest across the road yeah. passed smoothly without any security instances. Now let me turn to New Zealand where I have a clip. Okay. This film is Punch. It's available on Showtime and let me tell you what it's about. Jim is preparing for his first professional fight but begins to rethink his life's trajectory for his sexuality after tangling with Wei Tu, a gay Maori boy who spends his days in an old shack down by the beach. Jim is a 17-year-old boxer in a small town. He's a golden boy preparing for a fight that will elevate him to early professional status. All bets are on. All bets are on his climb to success, but his father, Stan, is a demanding coach and a notorious alcoholic. As Jim begins to rethink why he is fighting, his life tangles with Wei Tu, a razor-tongued gay Maori boy, who spends his days in an old shack with his dog, Moi Moi, where he cobbles together a fragile glamour and dreams of leaving town to become a musician. Away from the rainbow flags and pride parades, Jim and Wei Tu must navigate isolation, hypocrisy, um, the brutality of small town boxing and anonymous queer bashing that no one will talk about. Jim, as Jim stumbles toward discovering what it really is to be a gay man, he is forced to understand that strength has little to do with heroism. So let's take a look at a clip from Punch. Eyes up. Ah! Keep your rhythm. You have to focus. I set up your first professional fight. You see big break. I've got running. No, you don't. You're such a tease. Yo, what's up, bro? Yeah! <laughs> You made this. All of this. Do you ever get lonely out here? No. This whole town reeks of testosterone. Faggot? What? Huh? No, 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 that's Miss Faggot. To you, sweetie. <laughs> so, do you want this boxing thing? Yeah. It's like you climb through those ropes and you transform. I wonder, get the fuck out of here. You may not always shine as you go Barefoot over stone What? And you might be so lost You think you want to be mates? Hmm? But you're too scared. It's all right, mate. If not, it's not. And you won't be the star Touch me! In this town, it's a hyena. And I'm one of them. Can you see it? Did you say it? Showtime. Showtime. This, okay. It is getting a lot of positive buzz on the gay men's network. Oh, it is? Oh, it very much so. Mm. Oh, good. So oh, That was a good clip. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Keith. That first Pride Day. Yeah. Kind of punchy theme. Water won't run straight, and neither will we. Oh. And as a quick aside, the Victory Fund 
has named Vermont as having the greatest number of out legislators in the country, not per capita, total number with 14 yes. out legislators. So, all right, with that. Can we send some to Randolph? With that, resist. resist.